Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's professional development session on setting up your Zoom studio at home. Um, why <laughs> would we have a Zoom studio at home? Well, we're likely to be using Zoom for some time to come. And when I say a Zoom studio, of course, this would be something you could use with Microsoft Teams or any other sort of synchronous or even asynchronous um, online learning technology or modality. Uh, but the uh, health challenges that we've been dealing with since March of 2020 have not gone away nor does it seem are they likely to uh, excess, uh, to um, completely recede for a long time. Uh, it's another thing I'm not sure I'll live long enough to see. And not only that, but our many, many, many of our, almost all of our students at this point in time have had a taste of uh, remote learning in various forms. And surveys tell us that many of them have developed quite a, an affinity for it and enjoy it. And in fact, in many cases, prefer it, at least under the current circumstances. So our need for this kind of uh, work environment, workspace, is not going to go away. And if we're going to have to do it anyway, we might as well be as effective as we can possibly be at it and as comfortable and make it as easy on ourselves as possible to uh, interact with our students in this way in real time. So I, I've broken this presentation down into three levels, starting with basic stuff that you need to do a decent job in a Zoom class meeting, but that won't break the bank <laughs> or involve too many, <laughs> too many cables and wires and things like that. Um, then uh, level two is some sensible upgrades to this level one. Everything in the, level two would include everything in level one and. Uh, some extra upgrades that can really make your life easier and your students experience better and not cost you a tremendous amount of money. And then at level three, we're going to throw common sense to the winds or all sensibility to the winds. And we're going to talk about what you can do if you really get bitten by the bug. <laughs> so we'll probably won't spend too much time on level three. I'm not, uh, not hoping that. Um, hopefully uh, your uh, workspace at home won't start looking like this. So, but maybe so, maybe, maybe some of you would really enjoy that. All right. Um, so in terms of studio design, well, these are the basic topics we're going to cover today. First, ergonomics. You can't be um, effective if you're not comfortable and uh, able to manipulate your environment, your online environment. We'll talk about the sort of internet connection you need to do this effectively from home. What kind of computer? And yes, you will probably need a computer to do this right, not uh, a mobile device like an iPad or a, a smartphone, though, though you can use those in a pinch. What kind of webcam you might want to have and whether you in fact need a webcam. We'll talk about uh, reasonable audio and a uh, uh, something that's really handy for me, a secondary Zoom device. Uh, more than one Zoom device in the same room logged into your meeting and why you might want that. As always, please feel free to uh, chime in with questions at any time. 
I haven't even had to mute you yet because I haven't heard any background noise. <laughs> I'll do that if we get some some background crosstalk or something, but I'll leave you the capability to unmute yourselves by clicking on the little microphone icon in your Zoom menus at the bottom of the screen and the bottom left. And please feel free to unmute yourself and ask a question or join in with experiences of your own at any time. Let's start with ergonomics and some just some obvious what seem like obvious basics, but it's easy to easy to ignore this stuff to your to your comfort and detriment. Indeed, the caption on this picture that I decorated the slide with here was Zoom broke my body. We want to avoid that. Good ventilation seems like an obvious. You don't want to be in a stuffy closet or something like that trying to do a decent job. You got to be comfortable. And um, both temperature wise, ventilation wise, and everything else wise. A comfortable chair is an absolute uh, necessity because you know we, we may be spending an hour two hour two hours or longer at a time in front of our computers in a in a zoom class meeting and again if you're not comfortable you're not you're not going to be effective and you're also going to be testy <laughs> that probably won't uh, endear you to your students either uh, it's hard to maintain a, a a pleasant outlook on life when you're just not comfortable. Um, I personally found a, I went to uh, Staples and sat in every uh, office chair they had. You can usually find quite a good selection there and found one that looked like it was going to be reasonably durable, but above all, it was going to be uh, comfortable and I, I, if it didn't feel like I could sleep in it, I didn't want to deal with it. I got myself a, and and you don't have to spend five hundred or five or six hundred dollars on a chair to get that. I think I paid a uh, hundred and seventy dollars or something for the chair I'm in right now, and it's lasted me for uh, five and a half years now. It's showing a little <laughs> wear, but it's still very comfortable something we sometimes tend to forget. Decent lighting. Um, it doesn't have to be fancy. And it, you don't have to go out and buy a bunch of video lighting and things like that. Unless you want to, that's fun, but <laughs> you don't have to. But you want good ambient light. And above all, you want to and, uh, avoid the number one mistake. And you've all seen this in Zoom meetings, the number one mistake in, in video lighting, which is to uh, be backlit, that is to put your back to a bright window or a bright light or something like that. You want the light in coming at you, not coming from behind you. Otherwise, you generally just appear as a silhouette, <laughs> and that may not be as engaging to your students as you'd like. Um, the uh, and you can tell Zoom will show you what you look like to your students and so on. So um, just a, a reasonable, just a desk lamp pointed in the right direction can make a big difference. Um, just a, a, You just want to make sure they can see you clearly. Also, you want to make sure the background behind you is not overly distracting or um, unpleasant in any way to look at. Uh, uh, my tendency would be to have a messy room behind me, and that's distracting to your students. Also, if you intend to uh, do something like use Zoom virtual backgrounds, the less busy your background is, the more effective your, your virtual backgrounds are going to be, and the, the better they're going to look. Um, and we'll talk some more about some things you can do to enhance that as well, of course. 
Zoom does, of course, give you the capability to blur your background very easily. It's right on the video menu on your um, on your Zoom in your Zoom menu bar at the bottom, right next to the little camera icon, is an option to blur my background, and that will give you that will at least cover up a messy room, but it's not especially attractive to do that. So shooting toward uh, just a blank wall is great because your Zoom virtual backgrounds will work quite well that way, especially if the wall is not painted in five, four or five different colors. Zoom can handle any color, mind you, as long as it's consistent. But if it's a if you have a rainbow <laughs> painted on your wall behind you, Zoom's going to have a hard time with the virtual backgrounds. Um, and finally, adequate space to lay out, to lay out your computer and any peripheral devices that you're using, like webcams and microphones and uh, other cameras, things like that. Uh, just a big enough desk like this fellow in the picture here has to lay out your notes and things like that comfortably so you're not always cramped up and pulling stuff in and out of your lap and so on makes it a lot easier for you and a lot more pleasant and uh, you are going to get through to your students that much better this is probably the number one thing that gets ignored more than anything else in uh, setting up and, and holding uh, your Zoom class meetings. Take care of yourself. If you're not comfortable, if you're not um, able to function, well, then the experience is not going to be good for anyone. Internet connection. Obviously, you need a decent internet connection. That's, I'm not, <laughs> that's no surprise. Um, we want to avoid this message that you see over here, the graphic on the right from Zoom. And we've all seen that in, uh, when we've been on Zoom from time to time. Your internet con uh, um, uh, connection is unstable. And everybody's internet connection will go unstable every now and then. Or your neighbor decides to download War and Peace or something like that just in the middle of your class meeting, or the, there's some wobble in the technology. But you don't want that happening on a regular basis. And hopefully, it's mine's not happening today. I'm not seeing that message today, though I have had some instability in my internet connection today, but seems to be doing fine right now. Please let me know, as always, if you have any trouble hearing or seeing anything, um, I would appreciate it, and I'll do what I can. Um, the speed of the connection is not generally as important as its stability. Uh, far better you have a relatively modest bandwidth speed but uh, one that's stable and that you can count on because there's nothing more distracting for you or your students uh, than, to having, than to have you fade in and out, your voice fade in and out, or your screens blur and go away and then come back and so on. What can you do about that? Well, <laughs> the best you can do is get a you know, is, is take a an option from your local internet service provider that will allow you to do, to uh, effectively uh, present on Zoom with, to your students. Probably the first thing you want to be careful of is that your uh, connection has low latency. By that latency, we mean the time it takes for a signal to go from your computer to your ISP and then back again. This uh, governs how responsive your screens are, whether your what you're showing your students keeps up with your voice and things like that, or you don't get dropouts and so on. And the number one no-no 
vis-a-vis uh, -vis low latency is to uh, avoid traditional satellite connections like Viasat or HughesNet or something like that. And that, I know in some cases, if you're just a little bit too far <laughs> down the road from uh, uh, a, um, a heavily populated area, that sometimes those are your have been your only options. Um, but they're really not good for uh, Zoom meetings or any sort of connection where a continual uninterrupted and responsive stream of data upwards and downwards is required. And certainly Zoom falls into that category. Though Zoom will go a long way towards smoothing out problems like that. It's really very capable in that regard, but you really, you don't want one of those satellite connections, the traditional satellite connections, if you can possibly avoid it. And for another reason, those usually come with bandwidth caps. You can only send and receive so much data in a month. And they're those caps are generally totally inadequate for video conferencing. So those are just uh, not a good choice if you have any other choice. Now, what I'm saying does not uh, apply to low Earth orbit satellite constellations like, uh, well, there's only one right now that's, uh, that's really available, uh, Starlink from SpaceX. Uh, uh, whatever you think of Elon Musk, <laughs> he, his company is at least delivering reasonable internet access. Uh, traditional satellites are in G, uh, satellite internet, uh, internet provider satellites are in geosynchronous orbit, uh, millions of miles from the surface of the earth uh, to the point that uh, where the speed of light becomes an issue. And it, it takes quite a while in communication terms for a signal to go from your computer and hit the satellite in geosynchronous orbit and then come back down. The uh, satellites utilized by Starlink are only three or 400 miles so the latency is very, very low. It doesn't take long at all for a signal to go up and down 300, 300 or 400 miles at the speed of light. So just stay away from those traditional satellite systems if you possibly can. How fast does it need to be? Well, that'll, uh, that's really kind of a hard question to ask. I've got my opinion, but many other people will have different opinions. Uh, in my experience over time, I found that as long as I've got at least 30 megabits per second downstream bandwidth and 10 megabits per second upstream, usually connections are asymmetric. That is, you get more speed down, uh, coming down to your computer than you have sending data back up because there's much more data coming down to your computer generally than you are sending to the, to the internet. And a 3010 connection has served me very well for years now. I just recently doubled my bandwidth to uh, 60 down and 30 up, but uh, the 30 down and 10 up was worked pretty well for me. I would be very reluctant to go below that. Certainly not below the current uh, FCC minimum to be considered a band or a broadband connection, which is 20 megabits down. You could probably get by with that. But anything less than uh, your your Zoom meetings are going to be a trial for you and for your students. How do you know what kind of bandwidth you're getting? Well, you've probably seen the speed test from a company called Ookla. It's available for free on the web. All you have to do is go to speed uh, web to speedtest.net. And that's a totally free service. Um, the speed test will automatically find your internet service provider 
and then find another server somewhere on the internet that's not too far from you that it can talk to. And all you have to do is punch go. First, it'll give you your latency. 35 is pretty good. Anything below about 40 is, is really great. And then it measures your download speed. Thank goodness. I was getting, uh, I wasn't getting real good download speeds this morning, but it looks like my ISP has got his stuff together. And then it tests the upload. And it'll give you the numbers. So you'll have an idea of what your ISP is actually providing you as opposed to what they say they're giving you. I'm fortunate enough to have a, a very good one here in my little bitty town in uh, Northern Idaho. Uh, and um, generally I can pretty much depend on this. You really need dependable bandwidth. And this is one way you can tell if you're getting it. There's also an app for your smartphone that will do that will uh, provide you with the same service. All right, so uh, you know this may involve spending a little more money to get a decent band to get decent bandwidth, but it will be worth it in the long run for sure. Obviously, you're going to need a computer. <laughs> Well, maybe not so obviously, because you can host um, Zoom meetings from a smartphone. I had to do it a time or two when my internet connection at home went down and I had to go war driving. Uh, that's a term that we haven't heard much lately, where I had to get in the car. And at the time, I didn't have any cellular bandwidth at the, at the house either. So I had to get in the car and drive and drive and look at to have my phone open and keep looking one eye on the phone, watching for bars to pop up on the phone so I could get to, and then park somewhere and use um, use that cellular bandwidth to, to run the meeting. Uh, I don't recommend that, <laughs> but it was better than not running it at all and just leaving people sitting there wondering where the heck I was. But uh, initiating a or running a Zoom class meeting from a, a smartphone is not something you want to do unless you have no other option. An iPad or an Android tablet with a bigger screen, it's especially the iPad. Uh, the iPad has particular uh, capability in a in the in its Zoom app that is better than most other mobile devices. Uh, so you can get away with an iPad, but the computer is definitely the way to go on a regular basis. Be a laptop or a desktop, be a, a Windows PC or a Mac. They all work equally well, depending on the of course the power and speed of the machine. If you're shopping for a computer, I would urge you to prioritize features. Um, uh, Diana, good question. No, actually you can share your iPad screen quite, quite well, quite easily. In fact, now with most smartphones, the, the Zoom apps have caught up with the idea that everybody is using smartphones some of the time to connect to Zoom. Even with the uh, with a smartphone, you can share your screen. Not as flexibly as you can on the computer, but again, in a pinch, you can do that. Great question. Um, but when you're shopping for a computer, prioritize features over brand. They're all made out of the same components. Many of them are made in the same factory, which stamps a, one brand name on one machine and a different brand name on another machine coming off the same assembly line. Assembly line. So look for what you need, the features you need, and not the brand. Uh, they're all pretty much alike. Shoot, you can probably get a very good machine at a reasonable price by going down to, a, if you have a little mom and pop, a computer store in your neighborhood, you may be able to get a better deal there and a perfectly good machine. For minimums, for whatever, and again, this is a label this matter of opinion. <laughs> um, 
I wouldn't want to do this with a processor that was less than a uh, an Intel. The, the three major processor manufacturers right now are uh, the CPU, computer processing, uh, central processing unit, the core of the computer. The three major manufacturers are Intel, uh, advanced micro devices, uh, AMD, or Apple. And they all have very, they all produce very good, very capable chips. I wouldn't want to use anything less than an Intel i5, and you can get an i3, uh, used to be called a Celeron. I really wouldn't recommend that at the very low end of the Intel containing uh, computers, or an AMD Ryzen 3, or the Apple M1 chip. There, the Apple has started making their own C CPU chips relatively recently, and that M1 is actually a quite a good processor chip and has advantages even over the i5 and the Ryzen 3 at a comparable price point in many cases. I got my little um, Mac Mini, which is the first Apple computer I've bought since 1986 because I always thought they were overpriced and underpowered. But the little Mac Mini it really performs quite well. And I think I got it for five or 600, uh, 550, I think it was. And Apple was feeling good one day. <laughs> um, but those are kind of processor minimums. And you want four cores, uh, processor cores. Uh, modern processors actually have several CPUs on the same chip, so, uh, several central processing units. Uh, each one referred to as a core and uh, four cores is probably about the minimum you want for something like zoom which puts a pretty good um, demand uh, on your computer's processor wouldn't go with less than eight gigs of ram that's an absolute minimum uh, the little mac mini i have has eight gigs of ram random access memory the the computer's working memory and it does fine um and uh that will be enough in most cases but you'll see a lot of machines out there with four or even god forbid two and older machines and so on that's that's a recipe for failure with zoom you need usb ports universal serial bus ports the little rectangular ports or the little oval ports the new ones are tiny little ovals because these are the way these are the things you're going to use to connect various peripheral devices to your uh oh yeah costco costco is a great place to go looking for a computer if you actually want to see it and touch it before you buy it um great point there but this is one thing that uh, I would down check, particularly Apple laptops on, like a MacBook Air, I think has one USB-C port on it or something like that. Um, in a situation like that, you're going absolutely going to need a USB hub, which you plug into your computer and then gives you several USB ports, depending on the size of the hub. I've got one sitting over here. Let me show you what I mean get myself out of the way here play with my little pan tilt zoom camera here except i've got my head just in the wrong spot there we go that sorry just uh computer dyslexic here there it is there's a hub it's just a little plastic box with a cable comes out of one end and uh plugs into the computer and then you get several usb ports this one has 10 i think um that will allow you to plug other peripheral devices like mice keyboards cameras printers all sorts of usb peripherals so you really need uh, and zoom really likes to use lots of different peripheral devices so it's going to be 
your life will be a lot easier if you either buy a computer that has quite a few USB ports on it or buy a decent hub. And those can run you anywhere from 10 or 20 bucks up to 100 bucks or so. That one's on the high end of that. I think I paid 60 or 70 bucks for it. But it's from a company called um, Lord. Mind is a terrible thing to waste. Uh, Anchor, A N K E R, which makes very good peripheral equipment generally. Um, I've bought some that were cheaper in the twenty to thirty dollar range, and they worked. But I found that some peripherals didn't like them, and uh, that this one so far has handled everything I've plugged into. It. So the A N K E R was a was a good. It's a good brand for all sorts of peripheral devices. Okay. Um, so you're going to want to have, an, an, by one means or another, you're going to want to have an adequate number of USB ports. And unless you are a lot younger than I am, and younger than most of the people I see staring back at me here, and I'm just saying, uh, you're going to want at least a 15-inch monitor. Uh, that would mainly be an issue on a laptop. You can buy laptops with monitors as small as 12 inches diagonal. And unless your eyesight's a lot better than mine, that's not, uh, that's not going to be real comfortable over time. All righty. Any questions or other comments so far? Some good ones so far. I'll just jump in. All right, audio. We've all been in Zoom meetings where someone has spoken and we can't tell what they're saying. That happens to me more and more often with time. Uh, it can be a matter of uh, accent or just muddy sound or their microphone sensitivity is set too low so that you can barely hear what they're saying and so on. And audio isn't as sexy as video, but it's even in some ways more important than video quality. People will put up with poor video quality. They can generally live with it. But poor audio quality will drive people out of your Zoom meeting uh, en masse. They just won't put up with it. It's too distracting. It's too aggravating. Uh, it's too unpleasant. So we want to make sure that we can be heard. And we want to make sure we can hear our participants, our students when they have questions and comments during a meeting. So let's start with output first with speakers, since those are easily or easy. Uh, main recommendation there is if you're using a laptop, don't rely on the internal speakers in the laptop. They're almost always junk, even on an expensive laptop. <laughs> They're just too small to do a good job of reproducing voice. As the sound in Zoom travels across the internet and back to you, um, there's some inevitable, inevitable <laughs> degradation in the sound. And if you add a poor speaker to that, it can become very difficult to understand what uh, your attendees are saying. Uh, you don't have to spend a lot of money on an external speaker. I think these little Amazon ones here are you can go to Amazon Basics and get a decent pair of speakers for under $20. They just they plug in either plug into a speaker jack on your computer or into a USB port and they'll give you perfectly adequate sound for voice. Wouldn't recommend listening to Beethoven on them, but they'll do for a, a Zoom meeting. Or Logitech's a good brand like these. This is actually the system I'm using, the speaker system I'm using right now on my 
in my office. I think this one was 30 or 40 bucks and um, comes with a subwoofer. So I get a little bass, which can make it make your sound a little bit uh, more intelligible. Or <laughs> if you're, if you uh, are Daddy Warbucks or married to him or something like that, Bose, you know, nobody makes better speakers than Bose, but their computer speakers uh, run, uh, you know, hundred to two hundred dollars at <laughs> at the entry level. But I'm thinking about getting myself a pair of Bose speakers here, so because my hearing continues to deteriorate, and that will probably make it a lot easier for me to to hear what you all have to say, if I want to keep doing this, and I certainly do. Uh, but you know, or you can go down to Walmart and pick up a pair of external speakers that are not terrible, but just don't rely on those speakers in the laptop. Even more important, oops, to you, though, is the microphone, because that's the means by which your students are going to hear you. And that's the most critical thing, of course, during a Zoom class meeting. Again, avoid built-in mics and laptops where possible. They are generally not that great. And, um, you know, there are exceptions to that. You can try it and see yourself, but in general, I wouldn't recommend that. Uh, a really good option, because we're going to talk about webcams here in a minute, but a really good option is, is some webcams have very good speaker or microphones, excuse me, built into them. Uh, notably, the old standby, the Logitech C920 webcam has been around for 10 years, but it's still the, um... <laughs> Chris, <laughs> you had them before you, <laughs> before you became a, uh, an impecunious educator, <laughs> Bose, Bose headset. Yeah, the Bose headsets are wonderful. Um, but the microphones in the Logitech C920 are quite decent. And uh, they come, you know, with the webcam, the whole package for about 60 or 70 bucks. Another good choice is a headset microphone. Doesn't have to be Bose, but it's, it's, that's a great choice if you happen to have, it, have the money. But you can find all sorts of pretty decent um, uh, Head, uh, microphone attached headsets in uh, on Amazon or, or at Walmart or whatever. And the thing that really may, even though the microphone may not be the highest quality microphone that you've ever seen, having it positioned just at the corner of your mouth means that uh, it will pick up your voice very clearly. And that also, these types of microphones also tend to reject ambient noise better than uh, a more wide ranging microphone like the ones in the C920 because um, they're designed to do that. They're designed to pick up only your voice and as little of the ambient surround sound uh, in the room as possible. So they're a good choice. If there is a, um, a drawback to them, it's the, uh, the fashion statement they make. <laughs> they are, there's mine. There. You get a definite, uh, you get a definite uh, tank commander or um, uh, sky captain from the world of the future vibe with these on when you're presenting, because it's important that your students see you. <laughs> but but they they make great micro, they, they do tend to give quite good sound at a relatively low price. I think I paid $30 for that headset and it works great. You don't have to spend hundreds of dollars on a headset microphone to, uh, to get decent performance. But if you really want 
good sound. You may go for a semi-professional podcasting type microphone like what you see here. This is a so-called um, Blue Yeti. Um, it's been uh, the company is blue. I have no idea why they call it a Yeti. It doesn't look anything like the abominable snowman, but it is an excellent microphone. It's the one I'm using right now. Uh, and been my favorite for years, but there are lots of good microphones in this um, quality range. These things are used. You can usually get the black one that I have here on Amazon for about a hundred bucks. And the increase in sound quality is well worth it. I had to put mine on a microphone boom. That's a little excessive perhaps here it is right here uh because uh i found when i had it sitting on the desk and it comes a little stand and you can set it on the desk and plug it in it's a usb type plug-in so you, another reason why you need those usb ports um i found that when i use my mouse and i and i pick the mouse up and move it around and so on i get a little thump every time i uh i did that Putting it on a boom with a shock isolating mount like this uh, eliminates that problem. And I get nice, clean sound. Hopefully, you're getting nice, clean sound right now. Um, and again, that that's exceptionally important. Uh, the boom costs as much as the microphone, so that's not something you absolutely have to have. All right. But it does look cool. <laughs> Let's see. All right. So good audio, definitely something you want. Um, a secondary Zoom device. Seems like I missed something here, just a second. Well, that was incautious of me. Thought I was leaving something out here. Let's talk webcams for a second. I seem to have forgotten to put a slide in for webcams. Oh, well, you do need a decent webcam. Your students need to see you clearly. That is a, an incredibly important part of uh, synchronous interactions involving Zoom. It's one thing if you you don't care to turn on your video in a in a meeting, you know, a faculty meeting or something like that. But when you're speaking to your students, they really want to see you. They want that seventy percent of communication that is nonverbal. Your your facial expressions, your gestures, your posture even conveys information. Uh, subconsciously to your students. And it's really important they be able to get that. There are lots of good webcams out there. There are lots of bad ones. Uh, the Logitech C920 I mentioned here is generally available in any computer store, Best Buy. Um, I don't know if Fry's is still uh open down there they were always a good choice uh but even walmart sometimes you'll find these and they are and of course you can get them through amazon uh, a variety of other online vendors this is a a oh that is a sad day uh fries closed i thought i'd heard that but this is a good solid webcam. It will give you high definition video, uh, nice crisp video. As I as we mentioned earlier, it has decent sound, or it had decent microphones built into it. And it's just a good solid one that won't set you back hundreds of dollars. Uh, 
you can usually get them for 60 around 60 bucks or so at Amazon, or sometimes you'll find them on sale. Uh, other than that, just, uh, you know, buy it and try it, I guess, and take it back if it doesn't work. But this one will work. Or there's a whole family, a C920X family of Logitech webcams. Uh, some of them, or, or the Logitech Brio, B-R-I-O, is a uh, very high quality. Uh, I think the thing's even 4K uh, quality. Very, very good video, though the chances of you squeezing that um, video resolution that high or a video signal with that high a resolution through a Zoom meeting is relatively unlikely. Zoom is probably going to have to squeeze it down a little bit to make sure that it gets delivered to everybody. So a good HD or high definition webcam is more than adequate. And that C920 is an excellent choice. Okay. I also liked when I'm running my Zoom meetings, I like to have a, at least one more, indeed, just need only need one more um, computing device that I can join to the Zoom meeting so I can keep track of what you're seeing. Uh, I've got my, uh, got a laptop set up over here to my right. that's logged into the meeting. So I can just look to my right here and see what you're seeing. Because as we're all probably experienced, sometimes what you're seeing is not what your students are seeing. Particularly if you're sharing your screen and <laughs> you forget whether you shared, whether you're still sharing your screen or not. That is my, I, I am the absolutely the world's worst at that. So I try to keep another device going in the meet that's logged into the meeting in the same room so that I can keep track of what you're seeing and make sure I don't screw up egregiously. Because as I always say, please let me know if you um, if I'm talking about something and you can't see it. I really appreciate you just speaking up and letting me know. And a number of you have done that over the years, and I very much appreciate it. But people are naturally reluctant to just, particularly students, are naturally reluctant to interrupt you and say, ah, oh, uh, ma'am, I, I can't exactly see what you're talking about. Would you mind changing your screen share or something to that effect? So uh, having that device in the same room is uh, can be real handy and save extreme embarrassment from time to time. Of course, from... Uh, I try to make good use of it, but sometimes when I get get rolling, I forget to <laughs> forget to look over at it. So it's not perfect, but it's uh, at least better if I have that device running. There is one caveat to that, though. Be sure if you have a second device in the room, same room with you, that's logged into the same Zoom meeting. Be sure that you have the sound completely muted on that device, both the speakers and the um, microphone muted, because otherwise you're going to get a feedback loop set up between the two devices. And uh, we've all heard that from time to time, and, you know, at, a, at an event or something like that, where the, the audio just starts squealing like a, somebody's strangling a cat. And it can actually get loud enough to damage your hearing if you're not careful. So you really want to avoid um, that uh, feedback. So, and the only way to do that, if you have multiple devices in the same meeting at the same time, is to make sure that only one device has its microphone and its speakers active. This may happen, for instance, in a, in a classroom when you're Maybe you're running a Zoom meeting for some of your students who are not in the classroom. You have students in the room with you as well. One of them pulls out their phone or their laptop and logs into the Zoom meeting, and they forget to turn their sound off. And the next thing you know, nobody can hear anything. 
So watch the um, the feedback, but otherwise it's a very useful technique, one that I try not to run a meeting without. Okay, now all of those are perfectly sensible and very moderately expensive uh, aspects of setting up a home Zoom studio. It's kind of the stuff that you really have to have in order to be effective in holding a Zoom class meeting. Now we're going to go a step up, a, a reasonable step up, sensible enhancements that will have a significant positive impact on your uh, and your students' experience and satisfaction in, in your Zoom meetings. And starting with a, a better computer, Zoom puts a significant load on your computer's memory and central processing unit. A machine that's just got just enough capability is going to slow down from time to time. Or you may be trying to show your students something in Canvas or um, in another piece of software or something, and it may slow down and you may find yourself waiting on it or find it getting cranky <laughs> or it's a, it will, you know, it may take it some time to actually um do what you want it to do so a better computer is a a really good bet the next step up from what i recommended for the minimum and again a lot of this is personal uh, personal opinion though it is informed by uh making a lot of mistakes over the years uh an intel i7 processor is the next step up from the i5 that I mentioned earlier, that will give you significantly better performance. Or an AMD Ryzen 7, or better. Um, the Apple M1 chip is better, than, is as good as either one of those two probably, but Apple now has an M2 chip out as well. Uh, the, the next generation of their CPU chips, which I understand is quite good. I haven't tried it yet. Um, and upping the single thing, though, that you can do that will most improve the performance of your computer is to add more RAM. Many computers can be upgraded. Uh, or if you're buying a new machine uh, and you can swing the cost, 16 gigabytes of random access memory or more will help and make it much less likely that your computer is going to get sluggish or cranky when you're trying to do uh, some fairly sophisticated things in your Zoom class meetings. Even better than that, though, is adding a second monitor. You can get by with a single monitor, with a, just the monitor in your laptop or the a single monitor attached to your desktop computer, but your life will change dramatically for the better if you add one, at least one more monitor to that mix. And almost any, well, any laptop made today and almost any desktop computer that you can buy has the capability to drive a second monitor. Generally, all you'll have to get to do that is a monitor, obviously. Uh, and these, you can even a used monitor. You go down to your neighborhood computer store and pick up. They'll usually have a rack of old monitors that people have traded in or something like that and when they have bought a new system. And sometimes you can get those for, for peanuts. Or you can buy them from... Uh, <coughs> excuse me, from open box and remainder dealers like um, my particular favorite in that uh, arena is Tech for Less. T-E-C-H number four, L-E-S-S dot -S com. Goodwill. Excellent. Excellent. 
Yeah, Goodwill, your local thrift store. Somebody, you know, just replaces their computer and they got an old monitor laying around they don't have room for and they'll drop it off there. So that's that's excellent. Thanks, Chris. <laughs> That's a great suggestion. Tech for Less will uh, sell one to you. They sell a lot of what are called open box deals where they people buy uh, some computing equipment for use at a conference or something like that. And they use it one time, then they box it back up and they sell it back to a remainder dealer like this. So they don't have a huge investment. And they're not carting around uh, tons of depreciating computer equipment from venue to venue. And uh, they you know, can't be sold as new anymore, but often enough, they still have a full manufacturer's warranty and uh, can be had for significantly less money. And there's a whole section on monitors here. And uh, if we, uh, have it, if we sort it, let's see here. Where is that sort? Oh, I keep changing this. Ah, here we go. Low to high. I mean, here's a, a little used 17-inch LCD monitor. It's kind of small by today's standards, but, you know, $21. Uh, let's see. Here's a 19-inch for uh, 35 uh, You really want probably a 20-inch or more. Let's see what it takes to get into that. Here's a 20-inch for $54. It's used, but hey, that's fine for a monitor. Monitors last forever, particularly flat screen monitors. I have yet to see a flat screen monitor die. And I've got some that are <laughs> quite elderly. Does Tech for Less have warranties and tech support? Um, yeah, the warranty is very clearly stated. Uh, if it's a used unit, it'll probably have a 30 day warranty. But if it's an open box deal and they, they tell you exactly what the condition of the thing is, uh, you very often it'll have a full manufacturer's warranty. And if, it, if you buy it from them and it comes in dead, they'll take it back and they'll refund your money. And I have bought thousands of dollars worth of equipment from Tech for Less over the years. Uh, both personally and for institutions. And I've never had them uh, treat me poorly. Their customer service is excellent and they're a reliable vendor. That's why I, I mentioned them. There are lots of people out there doing this sort of thing, but Tech for Less over the years has been the best one I've found to deal with. You can count on them sending you what you paid for and taking it back if it's not acceptable. And so getting a, a second monitor is, is not going to be a huge cost. The other uh, thing you would need, of course, is a cable to connect your computer to that second monitor. And the nature of that cable is going to vary depending on the nature of your computer and the connectors on the monitor. Don't have time to go into that in any detail right now, but uh, I do have a recording on our open on demand site at sdccdolvid.org. This is our video tutorial site it's where we put our session recordings, like the one we're making right now. And uh, lots of other tutorials. This uh, URL, well, the link to this system is, is, is found numerous places, but uh, most conveniently for you probably, it's in my email signature. If, if you got an email from me, look at the signature at the bottom and this link is in there. Or just remember SDCCD for the district, 
O-L for online <laughs> and V-I-D for video, dot org, O-R-G, because you anybody can register an organizational domain. But this, um, on this uh, site, if you just search for monitor in the search box, you'll find several recordings of how to uh, of sessions where I have covered how to add a second monitor to your computer, um, be it a desktop or a laptop, a PC or a Mac, you can do this. And it's not difficult, it's not terribly expensive, and it will just transform your, your um, experience in Zoom because you can run Zoom on one monitor and put all the things you want to share with your students on another. And um, Zoom will allow, when you share your screen in Zoom, Zoom will allow you to um, select which, if you have multiple monitors, it'll allow you to select which monitor to share with your students. Like if I share my Zoom screen here with you, and then I go to share again. I've got four screens on this computer and I can pick which one I want to share with you. Um, and that means I don't have to do everything on one monitor. I don't have to drop my Zoom screen out of the way and then pull something else up. I'm not continually trying, waiting for new applications to open or looking down here in my taskbar and Windows or my ribbon on the Mac and trying to find the application I need next, I can have that, uh, that resource um, queued up on another screen and then just drag and drop it right into the screen that I'm sharing. And I can see it. I don't have to go searching for it. So, uh, Presenting in Zoom with two monitors is so much more satisfying, so much easier, and so much more effective than doing it with one. So that's a, that's a big deal. Also, or next, I should say, one of the things we lose uh, that we have in the classroom when we go to lecturing on Zoom is our classroom whiteboard, which, you know, if you're a, if you teach in the STEM area, which I used to, uh, I, <laughs> the only thing I have a degree in is chemi organic chemistry. Um, you know, you can't teach a lot of subjects without getting up and drawing on a board. And uh, Zoom, of course, has limited functionality in that way. A document camera, on the other hand, allows you to think of the old opaque projectors where you could slip a sheet of paper under it and turn it on and throw the image of the sheet of paper up on the screen or a three-dimensional object or whatever. Um, that iPad. Oh, shoot. Well, just need a three-dimensional object here. Um, document cameras, like this little IPVO camera here, IPEVO is probably the, it is a reliable brand, um, is a good choice. These became unobtainium early in the pandemic. You couldn't get them, or you, you had to pay an incredible premium price for them. Uh, resulting in a lot of knockoffs from various corners of the world being showing up on Amazon that were poor quality and, and unreliable. Um, there are several good brands, but IPVO kind of invented this uh, retail space. And their cameras are excellent. You can count on them. And their prices are reasonable. The, their entry-level camera is usually available for something around $100 on uh, Amazon. And um, this allows you to put something under it and share a picture of that with your students. Like my favorite 
uh, birthday card that I got. If I focus it since I just pulled it up there. My favorite birthday card I got from uh, some friends of mine with no respect for older people. A um, little bit of Pacific Northwest humor here. We uh, we actually occasionally have grizzly bears in our neighborhood here. Um, or you can put three-dimensional objects on there. Oop. That one, they need to reduce the glare a little bit. Things quite adjustable. So uh, you can tell I had that upside down. <laughs> Here's a, a cable I bought for my iPhone. Um, you can, and of course, you can just take a piece of paper and put it under there. And now you have a, a whiteboard equivalent. Made that too dark now. And there's little buttons on the camera to adjust things like exposure and focus and so on. Then you can just pick up the not so high tech uh, communication device and uh, proceed to lecture uh, and draw things on uh, just as you would on the whiteboard. The main difference being that everybody in the class will be able to see what you're doing even the ones who habitually like to sit along the back row and you know, where the whiteboard is only you know, a distant uh, image to them. Here, you can lecture and they can actually see what you're doing. And you can draw pictures. Mm -hmm. and graphs and chemical equations, anything you would normally do on a whiteboard. And your students will actually be able to see it. And you're not futzing around with things like trying to draw or write with your mouse or having to buy graphics tablets or having to use uh, strange whiteboard software and so on. This just is so much, just writing on paper is so much easier. And you can share that with your students. Again, this IPVO document camera, let's see what Amazon's selling this one for right now. Again, it's IPEVO is the IPVO document camera. Here's their, yeah. Uh, the list price on this sucker is actually $99. This 34% off is BS, but that's about what it should cost. Um, and uh, you can get it for a hundred bucks today. And they're quite available. I, I've seen that cam. Uh, in uh, April of 2020, I saw people trying to sell that camera for $400. And it's definitely not worth that. But the video quality is excellent. The, it's compact. Doesn't take up a lot of room on your desktop. And it is a terrific a little device. And it adds a dimension to your Zoom uh, meetings that you can't get any other way. All right. Another nice to have and very functional uh, improvement for your Zoom meetings is a green screen. Um, that I am, in fact, coming to you sitting in front of a green screen. Let me illustrate that here. Okay, that's what I actually, that's what's actually behind me. I've got a, a nice, good size, more or less semi-professional green screen um, because this is, <laughs> video is one of my things. 
but you don't got to have that. Uh, a few weeks ago, I did a, a dedicated session on green screen or chroma key, as it's called, chroma key technology. And just to make a point, I used a minimal, definitely non-professional green screen. This is a piece of non-woven fabric dyed the right color for uh, dyed the right green for green screen effects there's nothing magic about green the only reason they use this you see this color used commonly is that no one would be caught dead wearing that color except on saint patrick's day so if you're not lecturing on march 17th you're probably safe and um the chroma key technique works by removing anything of a certain color from your video signal and and allowing you to substitute another video signal for that and i set this one up and ran a live test and we couldn't tell i couldn't tell and the attendees couldn't tell the difference when i was using my nice for semi-professional green screen that I've got behind me right now, which is nice and even and smooth and evenly lit and so on. And I just took that piece of fabric and hung it up on what amount to two coat racks and strung it behind me. And we couldn't tell the difference. <laughs> the software and the hardware that uh, it takes to make this chroma key technology work is so uh good now that you don't have to have a perfectly lit green screen you don't have to have one that's that's perfectly smooth i've tried to iron these things i'm telling you that is that was the most frustrating thing i think i've ever done you don't have to do that anymore this is just a piece of junk uh non-woven green cloth or non-woven cloth to hang behind you works about as well as a really good green screen and this can be had most days that that uh, cloth minus the coat racks can be had for like 10 bucks on amazon most days so there's no real reason if you have your nice zoom space there's no real reason why you can't have a green screen behind you and this makes your um, your Zoom virtual backgrounds work so much better. We've all seen those situations uh, where people have activated a virtual background in a Zoom in a Zoom meeting, and you know they they kind of mer emerge and, and come and then fade away as they move back and forth or, or if they raise a hand or move their arm or something it disappears and so on it, it, very distracting max headroom exactly <laughs> okay chris you just dated both of us on that one but um the uh <laughs> yep <laughs> the uh uh it's not a good look. It's not something you really want your students to be experiencing. They're going to be uh, thinking more about how weird you look than they are about what you're trying to impart to them. Uh, the green screen will eliminate a lot of that and will give you nice, clean, virtual backgrounds. Indeed, when you... Oh, but I am still sharing my screen. Jeez, I, I can... Well, you were seeing what you needed to see anyway, but that, that was inelegant. Sorry on my part. But now I do need you to see this. When you go to activate your virtual backgrounds in Zoom on the video menu over here uh, and choose virtual backgrounds, on in that box, the dialog box that pops up, there's a checkbox you can check to, to indicate to Zoom that you have a green screen. That and in that event, Zoom will take advantage of it and will produce a much cleaner virtual background, or, or you will appear much more clean in front of the virtual background. And it Zoom, that will reduce the load that Zoom places on your computer. You can get by with a less powerful computer 
if you have a green screen and you, if you're using virtual backgrounds in your Zoom meetings, which are very handy, uh, because uh, Zoom doesn't have to do as much computing to try to wipe out that that uh, normal background behind you. It takes a lot of load off your computer and off Zoom if you have a green screen, and there's no and. And it's not just Zoom virtual backgrounds either. I have, uh, I'm constantly being asked in these meetings, how do you do this thing where you appear down in the lower right-hand corner of your screen and while you're talking about your PowerPoint slides or showing other screens and so on. And you know, here I am down here and you can see me, you get the, the benefits such as it is of seeing me. Um, uh, but you get the benefit of nonverbal communication and uh, it's more engaging your students if your students can see you they are much more engaged in the presentation um, and so it, it's worth doing but i can only do that if i have a green screen i'll talk a little bit more here in a minute about how i'm doing that i can't go into great detail but i can give you a general see of that and so a green screen is well worth having. And we're talking, like I say, at minimum 10 bucks. Uh, you obviously you can spend more than that. You can get green screen kits that have uh, supports and um, uh, various uh, enhancements. But uh, quite frankly, if, if it's going to work great. If you can just um, sit in front of a wall, doesn't matter what color or whatever, and just tack up the green drape behind you with a, some plastic tack or a pair of thumbtacks or something, it works great. Works as apparently as well with modern chroma key technology as a good green screen, which can cost you hundreds of dollars, you know, for ten bucks. So. Really, not a not a hard thing to do, and well worth doing. And this one, I mean, uh, you could just throw it over a door or something like that, and then take it down at the end of the meeting. You don't even have to have a dedicated space necessarily to use a green screen, though a dedicated space for all this obviously is a really good idea. And finally, better lighting than you can get with just a, a desk lamp or ambient light, whatever your overhead fixtures are and so on. A great solution for that is a little ring light. And these are again, very inexpensive, uh, as little as 20 or $30 in some cases. You can get them that will fit right on top of your monitor like you see here in your laptop. Or you, they'll, you'll get them that come with um, uh, stands to hold them. and uh, this gives you much better visibility to your students. It also makes your green screen stuff work a lot better if you're cleanly or if you're brightly and evenly lit. And of course, you can go hog wild with this. We go into much more detail on lighting when we do uh, our green screen technology seminar. But just, uh, you know, even just a minimal. Uh, lighting fixture uh, dedicated to to video conferencing can make a big difference in your appearance, which in turn makes it more engaging for your students. Now we're going to throw uh, sense to the winds. If there are any of you out there who are uh, uh, very fond of technology and toys and love to tinker and love to see how far you can push your spouse in allowing you to acquire gear for your Zoom studio, uh, this is for you. And maybe it'll be uh, at least uh, curiosity, uh, satisfy curiosity for the rest of you. Uh, 
what can you do if you actually decide to spend a little bit of money? Well, for starters, you can get better cameras. Something like the C920 is not too bad, but uh, that uh, something like, uh, you know, a decent webcam is not too bad, but uh, you can do better. The camera that I'm using that you're seeing me on right now is uh, about an $1,100 semi-professional, prosumer, they call it, uh, high-definition camcorder with a nice big, you know, they, the lens on the, uh, on the webcams about that big around, about, the, about as big around as a, oh, I don't know, half the size of a penny or something like that. And the, the lens on this camera is about like that. It does a better job and it's better optics uh, the camera, the sensor in the camera that converts the light falling on a detector in the back of the camera into electrical signals that can be reproduced as an image on the computer screen is much, much better on the good camera than it is uh, in the webcam. This is the camera I'm using right here. And... Um, it also makes your green screen technology work a lot better. Um, indeed, you can connect, oh God, Chris, you make a point. Many careers have been in the radio and television and movies have been ended by the advent of high definition cameras, particularly, you know, like newscasters and weather people and things like that. <laughs> if you don't have an established following about the time you hit 40, you're, <laughs> you're out the door because as you can see, the camera sees every imperfection in your experience. It's one of the, in your appearance. One of the reasons why I keep myself small <laughs> and put myself down in the lower left, lower right hand corner here. If I blow this up, oh God, no one sh my age should be uh, should do a close up. Uh, this is a high definition camera, not even a 4K camera, and it sees more than enough to. Let me get that out of there before <laughs> somebody uh, becomes nauseous. Um, yeah, so there are some drawbacks to having a better camera, you're right. But, you know, if we can put our vanity away, the students will still appreciate it. They know what we look like. We're the only ones who don't <laughs> appreciate how, how the ravages of time in some cases, because we can avoid those mirrors in the house when we need to. And indeed, Zoom will accept multiple cameras. Um, you can hook, I don't know what the maximum number of cameras you can hook to a computer is. I've never reached it. <laughs> I've gotten up to about a dozen in some cases and still been getting away with it, depending on the speed of the computer and its processor. But you can use multiple cameras with, in your Zoom sessions. You can have one pointing at you. You can have another one pointing at a display or perhaps someone demonstrating something along with you if you have a co-teacher. I've seen dance instructors use this a lot where they've, they've got a camera on themselves, but then they've got another camera on a student or a colleague who's demonstrating dance moves uh, on Zoom. And, and instructing, uh, uh, doing things that normally they have to be in a, in a dance studio to, to do and, uh, and in person with their students. So Zoom is extremely flexible in that regard. You can, um, if you click on the little menu button next to the camera icon in your Zoom menus, you will, if you've got more than one camera attached to your system, you'll see a list of them here and you can select among them. Like if I wanna go, I have to be careful here because 
the way I'm doing this, I can screw myself up and have to restart the session. <laughs> you, that would normally not be the case for you. But uh, I can uh, go to my HD Pro C920 webcam, and that's that's what that's seeing. So that's all there is to switching between cameras and Zoom. And you can attach all sorts of cameras to your computer that you're using to originate your Zoom class meetings. They don't have to just be webcams. They don't even have to be primarily or, or uh, natively USB connected cameras. Normally with Zoom and uh, other things being equal, you'd expect that you, any camera you wanted to use with Zoom would plug into your computer through a USB port, which pretty much limits you to webcams and similar sorts of uh, cameras. But there are adapters like this one, which are relatively inexpensive. I think this one was 30 bucks that will take a standard video output from a, a, a semi-professional or home use video camera that's not designed to connect to a computer and allow you to plug the video output. The, all, almost all cameras of that type would have a video output jack on them that would send whatever the camera was seeing to a like to a, uh, a tv screen or a, uh, a recording device a, v, uh, a dvd recorder or whatever but you can take that cable you can plug it into this adapter and then plug the usb into the adapter into your computer and your computer will see it as a webcam and you can use it in zoom that's what I'm doing with this um, with this uh, Canon camcorder that I'm using here. And you can actually do that with several cameras if you like. I've got three different cameras plugged in that way into um, my computer. There's that. Um, Canon camcorder that I'm using as my primary camera. But I've also, and darn it, I didn't turn it on. I've also got a camera sitting out on my back deck, which I forgot to turn on before coming in. Sorry about that. Which uh, is looking out over the lake behind the house uh, and is connected to this computer via a wireless uh, video link. And uh, what's the other one? Yeah, I guess that's the only one I have. Oh, no, and, the, and this pan tilt zoom camera that I'm using to show you the other camera right now, which I can't show you because that's the camera I would use to do it, is uh, also connected via a um, this adapter that I'm talking that I showed you a moment ago. This little devil right here. So I'm going to go ahead and kill that screen share. I don't really need that right now. That'll give you a little bit better view of that. So you can hook just about any camera that you can buy, a little ingenuity, into your computer and use it as a video source for Zoom. And that, of course, expands your options on what you can do during a Zoom meeting. And if you... with sufficient peripheral devices like that, there's almost nothing you can't teach over Zoom. You can uh, lecture on subject matter that you would never have thought you could do remotely. Uh, we do a wide variety of educational technology seminars this way including technologies that we were never able to uh, uh, 
teach remotely before Zoom or before Zoom uh, matured to the point where it has these days and the technology otherwise has matured. So that it's with enhancements like this, you can teach things over Zoom, or almost anything over Zoom. And some ingenuity and a willingness to, to take some uh, unconventional paths. So that's one nice enhancement is more and better cameras. And a really good computer can make sure that everything works and that you don't have slowdowns and glitches in your Zoom sessions. And this is a step above what we've talked about before for a computer, a what's called a workstation computer, uh, something designed for high-end media use. Uh, there are lots of PC, uh, high-end PC, Windows PCs that would fit this classification. Or the new Mac Studio, which has just come out, which is a, a little, a fairly small box about five, six inches high <laughs> from Apple that has tremendous power and capability. Looks like two Mac minis stacked on top of one another. And um, we're talking here uh, anywhere from the $2,000 and up. And you can go up as <laughs> pretty much as high as you like, but uh, you can get a, a, a first level Mac studio for about 2000 or uh, this PC that I'm running on here today, I think I paid 2300 for or something like that. And it really it gives you confidence that you're not gonna run out of memory, you're not, the computer's not gonna lag or die on you in the middle of a session and so on. And you can do some truly remarkable stuff with it. Uh, this probably means 10 or more processor cores uh, uh, 10 core better. That's what I've got in this machine. It's a 10 core. I think the M M1 uh, Ultra chip in the uh, in the Mac Studio has like 20 or 30 cores. There's like 20 or 30 computers inside one box, each one doing a little bit, uh, you know, just a part of what has to be done in order to make your Zoom sessions uh, work so well. Uh, 32 gigabytes or more of random access memory. High-end video card so that uh, you can transmit all this stuff to your monitors and to your students through Zoom. Not just the basic videos built into the computer motherboard in most cases. Uh, you tend to find that sort of thing in two places. You find them in gaming computers, computers that are built for gamers, which they have the highest um, requirements, the, the most challenge. They challenge a computer probably more than anyone else. So if you get a computer built for gaming, it's going to be a heck of a, it's going to perform like mad. And even if you don't play computer games, it's a good idea. And the other place you find uh, high-end video cards in large quantities is in uh, crypto mining. Uh, I don't pretend to understand cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, things like that, blockchain, old technology. It's a, pretty much a complete mystery to me. But I know that for some reason, uh, if you're going to use, if you're going to, quote, mine Bitcoin, which means in some way you create Bitcoin, you create value that you can exchange for real money um, or pay off ransomware <laughs> bandits or whatever. Um, you got to have high-end video cards. And the speculation in cryptocurrency, electronic currency, had until recently had gotten so crazy that lots of people were running these giant operations. They had hundreds of computers, all with high-end video cards in them, mining Bitcoin. 
again, I don't pretend to understand how that works, but they were making money at it. As a result, high-end video cards got scarcer than hen's teeth and high as a kite in price to really throw three or four different metaphors in there at one time. Um, they're very hard to come by. And they, if you could, if you got one, it would cost you. The video card alone in this computer I'm using right now cost almost half the value of the computer. It was about $1,000. The rest of the computer was about 1300 everything else. So, but those, uh, but the recent crash in the value of cryptocurrencies has meant that uh, high-end video cards have come way down in price and they're much more available than they were not too long ago. So it's not unreasonable to get a decent video card beyond the basic video capabilities built into the motherboard of most computers. And finally, uh, instead of a hard, instead of a traditional hard drive in the computer with spinning platters <coughs> and and moving parts inside and so on, um, it's much more. You get much better performance if you use a so-called solid state drive or SSD. Think a big thumb drive, <laughs> a big uh, USB drive, only it's built into the computer and plugged in through a, a bus into the computer. And uh, those have been, until recently, have been quite expensive, but they're coming way down in price now, particularly as the chip shortage eases a little bit, the, the shortage in, um, in memory chips has eased a bit. And these are much more, they're much faster and much generally much more reliable than hard drives with moving parts. So they'll greatly increase the performance of your computer when your computer has to access the hard drive and pull something off of. Um, so like the, the Mac mini and the Mac Studio both come with uh, large solid state drives in them, no moving parts inside. Um, and the, um, uh, you'll just get much better performance out of it. And finally, the cheapest of these question, uh, enhancements of questionable sensibility is something called OBS or Open Broadcaster Studio. Technically, I think it's Open Broadcaster Software Studio. It's OBSS, but everybody just says OBS. And this is a software-based video studio. And it's what I'm using right now to key myself over top of this PowerPoint slide and to do all sorts of tricks like, uh, oh, I can take a trip around the world here with you. Um, I can visit the source of the Missouri River or Yellowstone National Park or place I'm, uh, it's on my bucket list to go, Mount St. Helens, not that far from where I am here, or San Francisco, or Hawaii. <laughs> it's a lot cheaper than a ticket to Hawaii, or Paris. Um, you, OBS gives you a lot of the capability that the director in the network trailer parked outside the football stadium for Monday night football has. Uh, obviously not quite the level <laughs> that a couple million dollars worth of equipment and uh, a dozen or more uh, professionals working together would give you, but you can come surprisingly close. And perhaps the most amazing thing about OBS is that it is completely free. 
It is free software. It is open source. It is created by a group of enthusiasts uh, worldwide who, uh, who work on it, create it, update it, and just generally make it work. And you can download it from the internet and install it and use it for free. And you don't have to be a video professional to do it. If you're going to do this in hardware, you darn well, <laughs> you need a lot of experience and or a lot of education to make it work. But OBS is something that anyone who's willing to spend the time, and I'm not talking tremendous amounts of time. I We do a dedicated seminar on the uh, acquiring and using Open Broadcaster Studio that runs about two hours, and it covers everything you need to know to do what I'm, all these things that I'm doing here in this session today. And it works beautifully with Zoom. It is uh, seen by Zoom like a webcam. If I go ahead and share my Zoom screen again with you and go to my video um, menus here, among the so-called webcams or video input sources I have here in the top part of this menu, one is labeled OBS virtual camera. That's the output from my virtual studio. Just to show you what it looks like, let me share my share that screen with you. This is what OBS looks like when it's running. And of course you have, and whatever OBS is displaying here, if you turn on the virtual camera, is sent to Zoom or can is available to Zoom. And you can select that input in Zoom. So whatever you see here <coughs> is sent to Zoom. And as with any video studio, I've got multiple video inputs. There's my camera. Oh, I did turn that on. Oh, I forgot. That's the camera sitting on my back deck, looking at the osprey nest just down the hill from the back from my backyard. That's a an osprey and its chick sitting in that nest there. Or this pan tilt zoom camera I've been using to illustrate various uh, devices we've been talking about today. Or, I, and I don't have this set up, but I have an option, I have a, uh, an input that will allow me to use my, the camera in my smartphone or my tablet as a video source for OBS and thus also for Zoom, my document camera. I can also share uh, my computer screens this way. There's the computer screen that I have my PowerPoint slides on. Uh, I don't want to do the primary screen there because it uh, it's going to, well, I'll show you what happens. You, know, you got a, one of those endlessly repeating effects. Um, I can also share um, so-called media sources, that's a, a video playing off my hard drive that I look at when I get nostalgic for San Diego. It's a it's a video loop with various scenes from San Diego. Or I can put, and I can put myself in there as well. Uh, screen four and me, I, I share my screen that I have my video or that I have my PowerPoint slides on with me keyed in front of it. I can even put multiple sources in at the same time. Or have me and the Ospreys or those other sources that we saw a moment ago. And I could add more. 
it doesn't cost me to add more and it won't affect the performance of OBS or whatever. I can have as many different, this is like the, the director in Monday Night Football has 30 some cameras that he can call on or she can call on and uh, give you, you know, that encyclic encyclopedic experience of the game. You can do the same thing in a Zoom class meeting with your students. You can have these things set up. You can have videos set up illustrating concepts that uh, you're covering in the uh, in your lecture and things like that and show your students these things you can convert your zoom class meetings into sophisticated video productions that a few years ago would have required several million dollars worth of equipment and years of training and lots of assistance to pull off and now you can do it with a piece of free software and a few and a couple hours of uh, learning how to use it so this is definitely a sensible <laughs> i would not call this an an, uh, an unsensible enhancement to your zoom studio but it does there is a certain commitment in learning to use it you have to be willing to make mistakes and things like that in the process, though it's a lot easier if you have someone to lead you by lead you through it by the hand first time. Trust me, I know because I had to do it the hard way. I must have watched a dozen YouTube videos before I finally got it to start working for me. But if you have somebody who uses it for what you might use it for, show you how to set it up and get it going and how to use it, it's much, much, much easier. Uh, this is another uh, resource that comes out of the gaming world. Uh, OBS is most famous for being used by 14-year-olds uh, who want to uh, share their video game prowess with the world and their, their other little 14-year-old adherents. Look, I killed three times as many zombies as you did today and here they are and they're you know they're dying splattering all over the place in gory uh, high resolution color and so on uh, but the same technology that was developed for that world turns out to be incredibly useful in synchronous online education go figure i've never been a gamer never never been any good at it at all never had any real affinity for it but i sure um sure do like some of the technologies that have come out of that industry of course there's one other industry that also <laughs> led to a lot of these technologies that i will not mention but one that's um notoriously based in the uh san fernando valley in la <laughs> it also produced a lot of technology that we use but um the uh, and i'm not going to take questions on which industry that is i bet you can figure it out but the uh the capability the ease of use the power that these different technologies bestow upon us these days is almost humbling and we can do it all from home and our students can have an experience that they couldn't get in the classroom unless you <laughs> pulled up OBS on your laptop and projected it on the wall. And then they wouldn't get as good a view of it because they're seeing it right in their faces on their computer screens. So a well kitted out Zoom studio that takes you that makes use of these wonderful new technologies is an incredibly powerful instructional resource that's worth learning about and worth creating for yourself and i believe <laughs> well let me go back to my powerpoint presentation here and see what i'm forgetting i think i'm done yep <laughs> end of show all right uh, uh, let me go ahead and bring that back, uh, go back to the beginning here and ask you 
If you have any more questions, I tell you, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go back through the chat tool there. There were lots of good comments and questions in there. Let me make sure uh, that uh, I've answered those. Dave? Yes, go for it. I, I wanted to ask about the, the warranty, but I also asked about tech support from the from for less yeah you're more likely to get tech support from the manufacturer than you are from tech for less though they will help you uh with basics like getting it out of the box and and so on but uh tech support you're going to get more from the manufacturer okay thanks so you know if you buy it from uh, uh buy something from best buy or costco or whatever they have people you can call and, and websites you can go, go to and so on. But uh, they're also going to charge you a lot more for it. So. <laughs> sometimes those are the only warranties I do buy because I might need some tech support. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Dave. You bet. Um, but for, you know, something basic like a monitor or something like that, you're not likely to need much in the way of tech support other than getting it hooked up. And generally the directions that come in the box with it are more than adequate for that. Or there's always me. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. A, a question here. I like your studio would like to copy it. Thank you. What high quality webcam would you recommend? Hmm. Um, once I got to the C9, the Logitech C920 or the 920 or 92X series at Logitech, I started moving away from webcams and moving toward more professional cameras that I could hook in and and have them look like a webcam to the to Zoom or to OBS. But I've heard very good things about the Logitech Brio. B R I O. Let's see if we can find that here on. Uh, on Amazon. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can. Would you recommend in the long haul getting uh, maybe an open box of a uh, Canon camcorder set up so you don't that's, have to deal with all this other stuff? Well, that's what I did. But there's more hassles and more tinkering around required because then you got to have that adapter as well. To plug it in, you got to have an HDMI cable to go from the. You got to have the right HDMI cable to go from the camera to the adapter, and so on. And a um, let's see, Brio webcam is what I want. And something like this has it all in one package. That's not it. There it is, the Brio 4K webcam. And what are they, $127 today on Amazon. And this thing looks like a million bucks. I mean, it is. Have you checked out eBay? Pardon? Checked out eBay for a lot of No, years? you might try eBay. Somebody bought one and then decided they didn't, they didn't want to do that. Uh, but, uh, you know, you can get it any day on Amazon for a reasonable price. And notice there's <laughs> several different... Uh, Vendors, watch out on Amazon. You can pay more of the different price for the same device. Uh, and uh, uh, no need to do that as long as it's got the manufacturer's warranty, which this one does. And it's free delivery. This is a prime. If you have prime, this one's going to come free delivery wise. That's supposed to be a very good webcam. Then you can, if you want to really get crazy, uh, there are devices like, well, no, that really wouldn't be appropriate for a home studio. So, yeah, that that's one I've heard of. That's compact and easy, and it's got a it's got a USB connector on the end, so you just plug it right into your computer, and you can be using it five minutes after you unboxed it. Whereas if you go buy a camcorder. Is setting it up, you got to get a tripod to hold the camcorder. You got to get a, a cable to connect the camcorder. You got to have the adapter that will connect it to the computer and so on. You can get some nice results that way, but the, the video quality, well, my nice camera here is not 4K. That Brio is. So it, it's going to produce some really sharp 
images and it's going to work great with chroma key or with green screen effects and so on so if i were going for a for a high-end webcam right now i that think that's probably the one i would try first because logitech year in year out offers some of the best webcams around okay uh that's just but remember that's just one person's opinion and not entirely uh uh unbiased okay chris we were losing data with spectrum your internet service provider even though we paid for the higher package the technician informed us it was the modem switched it out and that one was worse they use refurbished modems oh, i i i hear you these particularly these big companies that sometimes the only option you have for decent internet access can be just very devil to work with. Um, I'm lucky here to have a small company that uh, guy moved into the area and couldn't get good internet access. So he founded his own company. He was a, a software engineer from Seattle and uh, came in here and said, oh, God, I can't live with this and founded his own company to provide access, internet access to the area. And is doing a fantastic job but you don't always have options like that and sometimes you don't even have options among major providers often enough there's only one really um, uh, practical choice in a given area so i i feel your uh, uh feel your pain there uh you can often enough buy your own access equipment and just plug their cable into it and have it work but that requires uh you know some some knowledge some experience and willingness to tinker uh my connection is a what they call a fixed wireless connection and the provider gave me a little small dish about so big that has the modem built into it and so on and then a cable that just ran inside that i but then once i i got that cable inside i could plug it into my own router i didn't have to get that from the uh, isp and uh particularly if you have a larger house something like a mesh router system where there are two or three routers in the system that talk to one another and you can put them in different parts of the house and cover the house much more widely that way you can get systems like that for 150 200 now that will work quite nicely even in a very large or challenging home because the perhaps the construction of the home blocks the signals from room to room or whatever uh those are wonderful but yeah i feel your pain sometimes all you can do is just keep trying uh and yes, we are recording this. <laughs> Costco has good prices on computers. Absolutely does. And they do, they're good. You know, they got somewhere to take it back to if it doesn't work that you can get to physically. And their prices are generally pretty good. Their selection is quite limited, more often than not, but their their service is good. And they have tech support. Uh Oh, Chris, you've got the boys, the Bose noise canceling headset. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I bought my wife one of those so she could watch her TV while I was teaching and not, <laughs> and not have that turn up on the, uh, on the recording, but I haven't been able to talk her into one for me. Uh, you can't go you can't go wrong with bose audio equipment and let's see and you shared a headset let's see what that was about is that coming up yeah oh yeah the logitech uh 390 yeah and look 23 bucks and it does great and it's comfortable to wear. Um, 
and the sound quality is excellent, both the microphone and the speakers. And of course, the a headset microphone like this almost eliminates the possibility of feedback, which you can get if you have an open mic and open speakers, you can get it if they're not adjusted carefully and placed carefully, you can still get feedback. You don't have to worry about it here. So that's a great, uh, great choice. Thanks, Chris, for sharing that. Yeah, open box. I love open box stuff. Well, agreement on that there. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> Very good. Uh, it sounds like uh, I've got three monitors, uh, Xeon CPUs. That's what I've got in this. I've got one Xeon CPU in this one. Uh, and, uh, uh, and Max. Uh, working on setting it up. I wish you the joy of it. <laughs> it's fun. I've got a little Mac mini sitting here and a laptop along with this machine. So it really helps uh, entertainment wise. Thank you. Some very kind comments. Thank you. Oh, my God. Uh, Charles, you say you're in Northern Idaho as well. Yeah, you're still here with me. Where are you? If, if you care to share, <laughs> I won't, <laughs> just in case there's somebody looking for you. Uh, I'm in um, uh, Hope, Idaho, which is near Sandpoint on the shores of Lake Ponderay. And my provider is a little uh, outfit named Kniksu.net or uh, Kniksu.com that only does this immediate. Well, they do a little town about 10 miles down the road and they do the area on the east side of Lake Ponder, uh, east side of Lake Ponderay. There's the website. And there, they have run fiber down the road just across the street from my house. And they are offering up to two and a half gigabits of bandwidth. Fairly pricey. I think he wants $170 a month for that. But um, I'm, I'm going to get at least a gig when they, uh, one, point, one gig when I... Uh, when they get me hooked up, they've been promising hookups for almost a year now <laughs> and gone come through with it yet. They've had some challenges getting networking equipment, but that's who I use. But you'd only have that access to that if you were in this immediate area of um, Lake Ponderay. Okay. Oh, Sam Marie. Yeah, no, he doesn't reach that far. And as you well know, Northern Idaho is not an internet friendly area. It's, I was here for a couple of years before I had decent internet access out where I am. I'm about 18 miles from the nearest town of any size. And I had a devil of a time getting good internet until this guy moved in and founded this little business. So I, I feel for you. I don't know who you might find there. Ah, everybody knows, a lot of people know Sandpoint. It makes a lot of those lists of the best small towns in America to live in and so on. It is a lovely place. Oh, yeah. Uh, Charles, I had, I had two internet providers at 1.2 and one was worse than the other one it was a toss-up which one was worse but one would work on some days and the other would work on other days and so at least i had somebody to try <laughs> the first one went down and that was costing me and i geez i think i were paying both of them i was probably paying more than this guy wants for 2.5 gigs for nothing too much of the time so i empathize <laughs> Yeah, I've got two providers, 
that are, are you hearing me now? I am. Two providers, plus I use my cell phone. Right. <laughs> at I, times I, as, a, as a hotspot. And I use that. I tether my cell spot. phone a few times. When Verizon yes. finally put a tower that my house could yeah. see, when I first got here, I couldn't even make a phone call from yeah. my cell phone. <laughs> I get two bars on a good day. That's same here. Same here. Yeah. <laughs> the joys of living, uh, you know, everybody wants to live outside the cities and so on. Well, there are consequences to that. I uh, I'm gonna put on a third provider. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I I started to sign up for the Starlink beta, the sat lower satellite uh, uh, provider, and um, actually got an invitation. Just about the time my ISP told me he was putting fiber down down the street, so I I backed off because it was going to cost me five hundred dollars to get the equipment, and then another hundred dollars a month or more to get uh, service. But I'm I'm really happy that that is an option, and the more remote you are, the more likely you are to be able to get Starlink now, particularly. The first latitude band where Starlink was available was northern I uh, is where northern Idaho lies, because something to do with orbital mechanics and so on. I don't know, but um, we actually have a uh, not uh, probably not 15 miles from where I'm sitting is one of the Starlink facilities where they link up the send the data up to the satellites and bring it back down and so on across the internet. And the the intelligentsia in my area thing is sure that they're they're getting COVID from five uh, G, you know, from the radiation leaking from this facility and so on. That's another issue with living in northern Idaho. But um, well, great questions there, and great information. How about some more questions? or more sharing. <laughs> I have a question on, uh, you're setting up the studio. Yes. Um, to try to keep the, obviously the cost as low as possible, but keep the quality as high as possible. I think, right. Down through there. Um, is there a, like, a, anybody uh, create a kind of a manual or anything like this that would show you the process of setting up the home studios? Well, this presentation today is about the closest thing I have to that, though I do have an equipment list of what I use, right. which I'd be happy to share and which I should have thought to share before yeah, this. That would be very helpful. Uh, and it realizes just what was available to me and what I ended up you know, it looked good to me and I got it and it worked. I, I don't have anything on the list that doesn't work well for me, but that's not to say it's the best or the cheapest you could buy. But let me pull that up. Let's see. I think I've got that on my Google Drive. Yep, that's it. And let me send you the link to that. It's uh, publicly okay. accessible. Should have put that in here. I'll try to make sure to add that to the recording, to the description of the recording and so on. Okay. All right, chat, there it is. I think a lot of the, uh, the major uh, uh, problems for a lot of new folks is getting their minds wrapped around everything on Canvas, connecting with Zoom, and setting up a basic studio to make the delivery of instruction more efficient, and then obviously it. integrating those three things together. That's pretty much the description I'll put on this recording, <laughs> indeed. <laughs> And then, of course, getting the, the link to, to the uh, equipment district to pay for all that. Pardon? <laughs> and to get the district to pay for all this. Well, yeah. 
I I don't have that option anymore. I'm I'm uh, a consultant now, the, the yeah. pro from Dover, um, because I can't work for the district if I don't live in California. I can't. I couldn't go pro rata or the classified equivalent of right. pro rata. Well, I'm just because, thinking the economic side for the faculty, it would make more sense for the district to take everything you were saying and to make it obviously more efficient for all of us as opposed to you know saying we have to be online here and there do hybrid or do zoom and blah 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 but also to organize in such a way that it makes it extremely efficient for the faculty because obviously the faculty our job is to do what to teach to deliver instruction not to be right you know, well they you know they make certain efforts in that regard the one of them is to pay me to do these seminars but uh they could certainly go further than that, <laughs> that, that. Has been wonderful it's just the issue is to institutionalize this in such an extent where it makes it more efficient for everybody and then take what you've said and and various um, units within the district are doing some wonderful things as well right. continuing yeah. it is doing a fantastic high flex instruction pilot uh, they're just breaking ground all over the place with that where they they have students in the classroom and on zoom simultaneously so they can reach people wherever they might be so uh, there are some good things going on but it could also it could always be better i agree all righty what else can I help with? I'll answer questions on any topic you might have them on. If you've got something that's been bugging you or concerning you, anything I can answer, I'll take a shot at anything. <laughs> In setting up the studio, I have one other question on uh, the Zoom connectivity in the studio and connecting it to the Canvas course. Do you have any other ideas about that to make- Oh, about uh, integrating Zoom and Canvas? Right, it looks like we, we have ba basically three things happening here. We got our Canvas, which is our foundation, mm -hmm. the Zoom, which is giving us the presentation, and then we have this uh, great studio set up for faculty. So to how, how do you integrate those things again back to making more efficient and right. economic? Well, each each one of those has a role to play in efficient online learning or in effective, I should say, online learning. Um, the you know the live interaction with students is irreplaceable, in my view. And for years and years we offered online courses and still do offer online courses where there's no real-time interaction between the faculty right. member and the students. Well, it seems like we started with, with, with uh, uh, Blackboard and WebCT, now we're in the Canvas era. Right. And what I've noticed as evolving, and, uh, and you, know, you and I have worked together on this. We, we have been uh, acquainted. <laughs> A number of years, uh, let's just leave it at that. <laughs> okay. What I remember, though, is that as it evolved, uh, we're going into the Canvas era, is in one sense, you're trying to make static course delivery active, uh, humanizing, as you say, it, right. in real time. And we're, we're slowly getting the technology integrated to catch up to make all of that uh, synthesized and more efficient. Indeed, all of those capabilities are available to everyone, but not everyone makes use of all of them, which of course is their prerogative. But well, Charles, thanks like so much for coming. around though, is to kind of coalesce it uh, together into a more coherent for a lot of faculty who are not into the, uh, they're not all techies, so to speak. And they shouldn't be. I mean, that's they, they shouldn't have to be. You're absolutely right. All right, all right. So we are doing everything we can to facilitate the, you know, the highest quality online instruction that we can provide. 
And that means using every resource at our disposal. Right. Like Canvas for you know it's Zoom or similar video conferencing uh, resources are ideal for real-time interaction and live information delivery, but you can't really assess your students or you can't communicate with them at on their own schedule with Zoom, but you can, using Canvas, you can provide information that they can access anytime, you can provide communication tools, that they can use at any time and get to you and talk to one another as well. And you can use, you, you can accept assignments through Canvas and assess their performance through Canvas and so on. Yeah. And of course, to, but combine knitting those two together, the synchronous and the asynchronous, and having both types of resources available in every course is the goal we've been working toward at online learning pathways for as long as i've been there and you know it's, it's better than it used to be and we're doing a much better job than we did years ago but there's still a lot of room for improvement you're absolutely right and yeah, I think having something like a, a decent zoom workspace a, a zoom studio at right. home is is a is a key part of that and which is yeah. why we offer this seminar. But I see what you're saying about uh, about coherence in the presentation and so on. So we'll that's something we'll keep working on. Well, I got to go, and I want to thank you again for another excellent webinar. Oh, you're too kind. It is, it is so good to uh, get to talk to old friends. So. Thanks for coming. All right. Well, you take it easy. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm off for a week and a half. So <laughs> I'll be back <laughs> toward the end of the month. Take care. Enjoy, enjoy, it. enjoy your vacation. I intend to. <laughs> you take uh, enjoy uh, Enjoy such as uh, of your summer as you have left. <laughs> I will. I will. Okay. Take care. Bye-bye. Take care. See you soon. I hope.